Democratic proposals to raise taxes on the wealthy have caused a stir as the party vies to challenge President Donald Trump in 2020. Presidential hopeful Senator Elizabeth Warren has her wealth tax plan applying to people with more than $50 million in assets. All your assets, wherever located, and we're going to keep counting. Freshman Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez has sparked fears with the billionaire class with her proposal to put a 70% marginal tax rate on earnings above $10 million. As she told CBS's 60 Minutes, and As you climb up this ladder, you should be contributing more. Senator Bernie Sanders also proposed an estate tax increase on people inheriting more than three and a half million. Most of the tax would come from people with more than $1 billion at their death. The gap between the top 1% of the U.S. population and the rest of the country continues to grow. CEO pay is about 300 times average worker pay. That's up from only 20 times in the 1960s. Calling to close the chasm between the ultra-wealthy and the working class is a potent political message that worked for Senator Bernie Sanders. This inequality is worse today than at any time since 1928. We are moving in exactly the wrong direction and even at times for Trump in the 2016 presidential race. Do you believe in raising taxes on the wealthy? I do. I do, including myself. The Great Recession and its aftermath helped to make populism more appealing across the ideological spectrum. Plus, the U.S. government is spending more money than it takes in. Conservatives have generally proposed cutting spending and services to tackle this issue. Liberals typically say the wealthy can pay more. So, is there a historical precedent for doing that? The U.S. has had much higher top marginal tax rates in the past, never dipping below 70% from 1936 to 1980, compared with 37% now. There's no clear evidence that the tax burden on the wealthiest Americans dinged the economy then. What is clear is that the richest Americans have taken a larger section of the pie since that top tax rate dropped. From 1980 to 2014, the top 0.01%, so the richest one in 10,000 individuals, approximately 23,000 individuals in the country, did experience a strong rise in income, uh, in pre-tax income, approximately 450% of their income uh, uh, grew over this, over this period. Whereas when you look at the bottom 50 of the distribution, the income growth of this segment uh, was very, very low, almost close to zero. It was basically 1%. And when you look at the bottom 20%, the income growth was negative. But a higher marginal rate doesn't necessarily mean that the rich pay that much more. The conservative-leaning Tax Foundation points out that the top 1% of the population actually didn't pay 70% in those years. Their effective tax rate, the total tax they pay over all of their income, was much lower. In fact, they paid only about six percentage points more of their income in federal, state, and local taxes in the 1950s than they do today. This dramatic decline of top marginal tax rate uh, didn't actually result into a dramatic decline in effective tax rate. And the main reason is because of the nature of the tax exemptions, the nature of the tax deductions, the different treatment of capital income taxation that might be favored in the tax schedule. And all these uh, pieces together uh, tend to determine what is the effective tax rate in the economy. So if the top marginal rate was to go back to 70%, how much money would that raise? The only honest answer is nobody knows. The Washington Post estimated Ocasio-Cortez's proposal could raise north of $700 billion over 10 years. But the Tax Foundation pointed out that behavioral effects, meaning the rich figuring out ways to avoid paying the full tax, would significantly lower revenue. They say it would raise less than $300 billion. Still sounds like a lot, but not enough to pay for the major programs many of the Democrats are talking about. Tax avoidance is a big and real concern when it comes to raising rates on the wealthy so much. If the objective of the, uh, of the policy is to raise the effective tax rate, then uh, the policy should be structured in a way uh, to avoid loopholes, to treat as much as possible different sources of income in, a, in an equal fashion. However, the argument for taxing the rich isn't just about raising government revenue. Economists who study income and wealth inequality also warn about the potential for various sorts of political, economic, and social catastrophes if the issues are not addressed. The wealthy have preferred lower tax rates, and uh, that means less money for education. People have identified links between income inequality and the Great Recession. When you have that kind of, you know, that much 
money without productive investment, sloshing around, you know, creates this kind of casino economy that uh, puts everyone at risk. Critics of growing inequality worry not only about exacerbating disparities in access to education and economic and social mobility, but also fret about how wealth concentrates political power. You know, so higher taxes on the rich is not necessarily just about redistribution, right? It's about inequality itself and the problems that has. The preferences of the rich are dramatically more uh, represented in the policy making process than you know, the preferences of the non-rich. I think Warren and Sanders would, of course, like to use that money to redistribute. But I think it is important to recognize the, the difference there, that there is, it's not just about redistribution, it's about, uh, it's about you know, the inequality itself. Economists Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zuckman, who've advised Warren on her tax plan, write that an extreme concentration of wealth means an extreme concentration of economic and political power. They also note that raising taxes on the wealthy is only one way to address inequality. Other avenues would include restricting things like CEO pay, tougher regulation on monopolies, and programs to help boost the poor. Inequality in general is not necessarily a bad thing, but the problem is that inequality of outcome today becomes inequality of opportunity to tomorrow through the uh, transition and the transmission of economic advantages from one generation to the other. Uh, generally speaking, you see a greater level of opportunity in countries with lower level of income inequality, sure. This is a fairly established uh, economic uh, uh, correlation. Peer nations to the United States, like Australia, France, Germany, Japan, and the United Kingdom, all had top marginal rates of 45% in 2017. Some countries like Austria, Belgium, and Israel go even higher. The U.S. stands at 37%. Of course, this doesn't include state and local taxes that also hit the rich, but European countries have other taxes beyond just income tax as well to pay for their more robust social services. Opponents of higher taxes on the wealthy argue that raising taxes will discourage entrepreneurs to innovate and succeed. They also say a bigger tax burden will hit economic growth and question how much it will really do to reduce inequality. It would be harmful to the economy, and I'm not, I'm not saying that collecting more tax revenue is harmful to the economy. I'm saying that we have to compete in a global theater. But there is also evidence that inequality may be hurting broader economic growth. And the reason is simple. The rich just don't spend as much of their income as the poor. And overall, there are many more poor and middle-class income people spending money. In a 2017 speech, Federal Reserve Governor Lyle Brainerd said inequality could damage the economy through lower consumer spending. She said some research suggests that widening income and wealth inequality may damp consumer spending in the aggregate, as the wealthiest households are likely to save a much larger proportion of any additional income they earn relative to households in lower income groups that are likely to spend a higher proportion on goods and services. She pointed in part to a 2016 International Monetary Fund working paper that suggested aggregate consumption dropped by about 3.5% from 1998 to 2013 due to inequality. So it really seems like you can have your cake and eat it too with a, with a high uh, top uh, marginal income, right? It, it, it reduces income inequality and it also doesn't seem to hurt economic growth and maybe Maybe it even spurs it. The debate about the effects of higher taxes on the wealthy is unlikely to go away between now and November 2020. Polls have found Americans broadly favor raising taxes on the wealthy, like this Fox News poll. Yeah, on incomes over 10 million bucks, uh, those that are in favor of that, 70 percent. Even some business titans, from Warren Buffett to Jamie Dimon, have said they are willing to pay more in taxes. Democrats are trying to defeat a billionaire businessman president who backed tax cuts. Critics say those cuts gave disproportionate benefits to corporations and the wealthy instead of the working class. We don't know how much Trump individually benefited from the tax bill he signed because he hasn't released his tax returns to the public. There may be some wealthy taxpayers paying more with the new tax law. But remember this? You believe in raising taxes on the wealthy? I do. I do, including myself. Well, overall, he didn't.